Welcome to IT Pro TV. You're watching the CompTIA IT Fundamentals for Exam FC0 U61. I'm your host, Ronnie Wong, and today we're diving into, well, our little mini series here on databases. We're taking a look at table design. And here to help us understand what that means is going to be Mr. Don Pazette himself. Don, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Ronnie. And we're going to dive into some, some really cool stuff here. In the first couple of episodes, we talked about what databases were. In the last episode, we got to see how to, how to talk to a database and how to use SQL to, to communicate and get the information we want. But in this episode, I wanted to go a little more uh, designy, I guess, <laughs> uh, a little more sciencey, and talk about exactly how these databases are built up. Because if you're responsible for designing a database, the decisions you make in the early stages can have lasting effects inside of a company. And there are many, many organizations out there right now that have products that are very slow and very difficult to add features to it because databases weren't designed right from the very beginning. And making a change later on down the road can sometimes be nightmarish. So in this episode, we're going to talk a little bit more conceptual about what, uh, what a table is, how tables are built, how our data is arranged. Now, all of that gets stored inside of a database. So we're going to have a little bit better understanding of how that, that works. All right. So, Don, now that we understand that a table is kind of the fundamental unit inside of a database, uh, what is it that makes up a table? All right. So a table is, and we usually represent it as a grid, right? But it's really a construct built up of rows and columns. So columns are kind of our vertical lines and rows are our horizontal lines. And where they intersect, you have a cell which stores some kind of a, a value, right? That's no different than a spreadsheet. But what's different is that in a database environment, each row represents an independent entity, right? It's an entity, a collection of data that is stored in that row. And the database is having to keep track of not just what the data is, but where it's stored physically on physical disk and in RAM so that it can retrieve it very, very quickly. So a lot of that comes into play. In order to store things efficiently, it has to have a good understanding of what that data is going to look like. It doesn't necessarily have to know what the data is, but what the data is going to look like because different data gets stored different ways to make it optimal. So when we create a table, it's actually going to operate inside of what's called a schema. And a schema is like a set of rules. In the very first database episode, I brought up a diagram. I've got it on my screen right now, this diagram. And I was just talking about it as a collection of tables. But what I'm really looking at here is what's called a database schema. This is a set of rules that apply to a database. And it's it's represented graphically here versus in the database itself where it's a logical implementation. But, but here it's graphical. And what it's trying to do is tell me exactly how my data is supposed to operate. So for example, if I'm going to add a, a contact, a user to my, my contact table, when I do that, these are the five pieces of information that I'm supposed to have for that user. I'm supposed to have a contact ID, a first name, a last name, a phone number, and an email address, right? Now, these are the column names, and I might have millions of contacts, and each one of them would have a first name and a last name and a phone. When you're designing the database, you don't want to design with millions of rows sitting in front of you. So we normally design this way, where we're just thinking about those columns, and those columns make up a table, and the collection of tables makes up your database. The database is going to be one or more tables that contain one or more rows, and all of that is the data that you find. Now, when we start punching information into the table, those rows are going to contain these values, and the values have to conform to what's called a data type. And the data type is probably one of the more uh, confusing things that we, we talk about when we work with databases like this. So I'm going to save that for a little bit later in this episode, and we'll talk about the data types all at once. But each of these pieces are really essential to be able to get the information that we want. Now, if I go back to my live database here, we can kind of see how this breaks down, that I've got the database. My database is called AdventureWorks. Inside of the database, I have tables. Inside of my tables, I have a table called uh, person.address. Okay, so here's a table that has addresses for, I assume, people. <laughs> and if I, if I open up that table, and I'll just select the first handful of rows out of it, and I take a look at it, I can see I've got address line one, address line two, a city name, a state, a postal code, a spatial location. That, that's used for pulling up map coordinates, right? So, so we've got all this different information stored right here inside of this table. Each of these columns are what's represented in that schema diagram I was showing a moment ago. These are all different pieces 
of what I store for somebody. Each row is a record. Record number three happens to correspond with 7484 Roundtree Drive, right? That's row number three. If I were to delete that record, all the other records would still be fine. They would still operate. Things would be just normal for them, right? Nothing too crazy. But as long as it's there, I can query it. I can get that information, and it's intact. Now, when I define a table, I'll define those columns. This is the data that I want to have stored. Some of it I might make, make optional. Some I may make required, right? Look at address line two. See how it says null? Null, and, and it's kind of um, glowing or backlit or whatever, yellow. It, it, just, it looks different, right? Null doesn't mean somebody came in here and typed N-U-L-L. -L. It means that it's empty. There's actually nothing in there, right? Nothingness just means that there's this void of data. And that's okay because not everybody has two address lines, right? Somebody might be 1970 Napa Court Suite 12 or Apartment B or whatever. They would have that address line too, but a lot of people don't. And so that's an optional field. Address line one, though, is required. If I'm going to bother putting in an address, then I need at least one line. Everybody has a city. Everybody has a state and a postal code. Those may be required. So when we create a table, we have to define that. We have to say, here's the data I expect to have, and here's the data that I require to have, and here's other data that may be optional, that maybe I don't need. It's up to me whether I want to define that. Okay? You can even define constraints. Constraints are like rules that say, um, well, take, for example, postal code. Postal code is really just a number. right? Here in the U.S., your zip code is a five-digit number. Right? Well, they have that crazy... Plus four. Uh, yeah, like plus four where it adds more. But let's just, let's just pretend the world <laughs> is simple. And it's just five numbers like this, right? I could create a constraint that says this field is required. It's got to have something. And it has to be five numbers. Can't be four numbers. Can't be six numbers. Can't be empty. Can't be letters. That it has to be five numbers. Now I'm protecting my database integrity. Well, whoever designs this table... In other words, you or me, if we design that table, we can define those rules. That's part of what goes into database design and creating a table. It can be very simple, right? In the last episode, I whipped up a table called US states, and I didn't really create many rules on it at all. I just said the state could be up to 50 letters, and the abbreviation could be up to two letters. That, that was it, right? After that, you put whatever you wanted. In fact, I didn't even really say two letters. Like I, you could put two numbers in there, it would have been fine. I didn't get very restrictive. But you can. That functionality is there. It's very, very powerful. So defining the fields and the columns, that, that's just one part of designing a table. There's a, a lot more to it. So this, uh, this diagram here that I have, this is actually from a, a website. You can pull this up on your own computer called dbdesigner.net. dbdesigner.net is a, a free service, and I like to use it anytime I mock up a database because I can kind of do the design here in a graphical environment, just kind of drop elements on there. And once you get everything set the way you want, you can go up here to export, and it will export the SQL, the, the query command that you need to run to create that table. And you can even tell, like, I want to do this in MySQL or Microsoft SQL Server or Oracle Postgres. I'm using Microsoft SQL Server. So I can choose that. I can say generate the SQL, and there it is. Here's the command I would need to run on the server to create all the tables that I have on my screen right now. So it's neat to be able to do that and do it in a graphical interface like this because I can sit here and manipulate and move things around. So this database right here is designed around sales. Uh, you know, I want to sell something. And so I've got orders, right, when somebody buys something. I've got the contact, who it is that bought it. The products, what they bought. We've got the promo code, if they, if they used a coupon or discount, I need to keep track of those. And then the transaction status, right? Have they paid? Is it ordered but not delivered? Has it been shipped? Like, what is the status? That's, that's the thing that I'm tracking. Well, maybe I decide later on, you know, maybe I need to keep track of um, uh, damaged inventory or, or something like that, right? Uh, so I have some extra information that I want to keep track of. Well, I may want to add another table for that. So if it's a return, for example, so I'm going to come in and create a, a new table in here. So I'm going to whip up a new table. Actually, see that up, up here. And I can edit that table, and I'm going to call this um, returns, right? Or I, most retail, let's call it, um, what do they call it, loss, loss prevention or something crazy like that. But I'll call it returns because I don't know what it's actually called. Uh, so I'm going to create this table called returns. And then I have to think about the data that I have one in there, right? Okay, well, 
It's a return. What's being returned? An order. Somebody placed an order and they bought something. Well, the order is going to come out of my order table and we have like an order ID. So I might punch that in there, right? So I'm going to have that and, uh, and I'm just going to save that and throw it in. Then if they're returning something, maybe they're not returning the entire order. Maybe they're returning just one product from that order. So I might have the product ID stored in here as well. And then maybe they bought five jars of shampoo. You know, shampoo doesn't come in a jar. Five bottles of shampoo. <laughs> and they just want to return one of the bottles. The other four are fine, right? So now I need to, to track some kind of quantity so that I know how many of those they returned. So I can see if it wasn't like all five, it was just four of them or, or one of them or, or whatever. I want to track that. These are things that I want columns for, right? And as I define each of these columns, I can define additional data, like whether it allows nulls, okay? If somebody's doing a return, I need an order ID. If I'm allowing nulls, somebody could return an item without an order ID. If they don't have an order ID, that means they didn't have a receipt. Somebody's coming in with no receipt. They just have this, this bottle of shampoo and they want to get money for it. Where did they get it? Maybe it's stolen. Maybe it came from a hotel. Who knows, right? Well, I think we all know that the customer is always right. So plenty of places do returns without receipts. But if I want to be a stickler, you've got to have an order ID. I don't want to allow nulls. And that's it, right? That's a limitation that I can put on there. There's also the limitation of being unique. When somebody buys something, I give them a receipt. The receipt has an order number on it. I should never have two orders with the same number. The order number should be unique. I might have 50 customers named John Smith. Plenty of people have the same name, but I should only have one order with an order ID of 522784 or you know, whatever number it is that it assigns. Those should be unique. I can flag a column to require it to be unique. And by doing that, I'm basically placing a constraint on that column that says, you're not allowed to duplicate a number. I can even get a little more advanced and say, I'm gonna auto increment, right? If somebody's placing orders, in fact, here, let me, let me get out of, let me cancel that one and just go straight to my order table here under order ID. If somebody's placing an order, I want it to be a unique number and I want it to auto increment. The next order is just going to have whatever the next number is in order. I want to keep moving up. That helps to ensure that I don't get duplicates. But if somebody tries to direct edit an order number and they try and pick some existing number, it'll fail. It'll stop them from doing it. This is all part of design. When we design the table, we have to figure out what we want to, to enforce uniqueness or enforce uh, auto increments or whatever. These are advanced options that databases give us the ability to set. Now, Don, taking a look at this, uh, the other options that you're also showing there, uh, what, what are those options about where it says like primary key and foreign key? What, what does that help us to do? All right. In an unstructured database, you won't see those, right? But in a structured database, a relational database, it assumes that all of our data is related somehow, right? At a minimum, I could say, well, I own the data, so I'm how it's all related. But there is some kind of relationship between each of these. So, for example, if I take order and contact, right? An order is when somebody bought something from my company. A contact is the person who bought something, right? These two are related because somebody placed the order. So, in my order table, I've got a contact ID. Who is it that placed that order? And in my contact table, I've got a contact ID. Who is the contact? So here's contact ID to sort in two different places. That's not two different contact IDs though. They're related, right? In my contact table, I will only have one contact with a particular ID. I won't duplicate IDs. So if Ronnie's a contact, he'll have an ID. Maybe he's an ID number one. And I might have a contact, I'm ID number two. And in my order table, if I see an order that has a contact ID of one, I'll know Ronnie placed the order. And if it has a contact ID of two, I'll know that I placed the order, right? That's, that's the relationship between those fields. So up here in contact, I will only have one contact with a particular ID. It's a unique value. And if I take a look at that contact ID, you'll see where I've flagged that as a primary key. A primary key means this is a unique identifier that identifies this particular record, right? And that record might be Ronnie's, might be mine, might be yours or whoever's. It, it's, that, that's you, and it's a primary key. Now, over in the other table, 
it's referencing contact ID also. But here, it's not going to be unique because Ronnie might place five orders. I hope he does, right? As, as a store, I want Ronnie to place all his orders with me, thousands of orders. So I might have a hundred orders, all with Ronnie's ID attached to them, okay? That doesn't mean I can just pick some random ID and stick it in there though. It needs to be a valid ID coming from my contact table. So when I look at contact ID here and I edit that, it's flagged as a foreign key, right? A foreign key means that this contact ID does uniquely identify a person, but the person's not here in this table. The person is somewhere else. And if you see these blue arrows here, the blue arrows are what's linking contact ID here with contact ID up here. If I take my returns table where I've got order ID, order ID is a primary key down here in the uh, uh, order table, right? Well, up here, I can say that this order ID is a foreign key. It should be linked to the order ID down there. Now I'm gonna run into a slight problem, which is each table really should have at least one primary key. And I don't have a good candidate here for a primary key. I'm gonna add one more field, which I'm just gonna call the return ID. So I'm gonna track my return. And you know, I'm naming these with an underscore. You don't have to do that. I, you know, I could call it return ID. You can even have a space in there, but spaces get really super annoying. Because anytime you have a space in a name, you have to square it in blocks like this so that it knows that there's a space. So I don't normally do that. But if I wanted to call it return ID, I could do it that way too. But when I define that, you know, this is gonna be my primary key for this table. And so I'll save that. So now I've got my return ID. I've got order ID. I want that to be a foreign key of order ID from the order table. And so I can edit that. And I can come in here and I can say that it's a foreign key. And when I do that, it's gonna say, all right, well, it's a foreign key of what? and I can pick the order table and order ID right there, and I can update. And when I do, see how it drew a, let me move this, a nice little blue arrow there for me. And that blue arrow is showing how order ID up here does identify a unique order, but the order's not stored here. It's stored whoop, down here in the order table. And it, it, you have to make that noise when you do it. Uh, <laughs> and then that's the, that's the only order that's going to have that order ID. I need to do the same thing with product ID, right? Because that's going to link over to my product table. So I need to say that's a foreign key. That's linked over to my product table. It's linked to product ID. And there we go. Um, you know, maybe I have contact and so on. But now I've got that foreign key. This product ID should be an entity that exists over here in the product table where it should only occur once in this table. It might uh, appear multiple times here in returns. Right, and that's that's where the value of this comes out. Is I might say, what product am I selling this returned the most? Uh, maybe I want to stop selling that. <laughs> I don't want to process so many returns. Maybe there's something wrong with that product. We can start to analyze and we can find that out. But defining these relationships is how the database becomes useful. How it understands what it is that I'm really looking at and how I can pull that data out and get a chance to look at it. Right? Now, this is one part of database design. If you really want to become a database administrator, you'll start learning about more things like indexes. Indexes are a way of optimizing queries. If I know I'm going to run a particular question, I can make that question run faster if I build an index for it. In the first database episode, I gave the example of an encyclopedia set, right? If I wanted to look up the Queen of England, I knew that her last name, or the first, <laughs> first word was queen, starts with a Q. So I had volumes A through Z. I could slide over and find volume Q. I could open that up. And it was alphabetized. I could get to QU, which is probably most of it, and get to QUE, and then I could find Queen of England, right? That process, I had to dig through to find that, right? Well, I knew how that data was ordered. So I was able to get there pretty quickly. I knew to go to the Q volume. So I immediately cut out 25 other books, right? Just off, because I'm going to Q, right? That speeds things up. Well, with databases, they don't do that by default. In fact, by default, if I were to look for Queen of England and there were a million rows, it would start at row number one and say, is this Queen of England? Nope. Let's go to row two. Nope. Row three. Nope. Row four. It would be like me going to the encyclopedia and taking volume A, starting on page one, and going through each page, and then put it back on the shelf, go to volume B, go to each page, then volume C, D, E, until I finally got to Q and I finally got to Queen of England, it would take a long time, right? That's not efficient. So indexes speed that process up. An index, like, like most encyclopedias, they had an index, or if you have a textbook, at the very end of your book is an index, and if you want, if you have your biology book and you want to look up um, 
aphids. Well, you go in the index, you find aphids. Oh, it's on page 273. You go right to page 273, and there's your data. That's what indexes do in a database, is, hey, I want every employee whose last name starts with Q. You go to the index, it tells you exactly where on disk those employees are stored, it retrieves them, it brings it back, and you get the information. Indexes speed that up a lot more. When we design tables, and we flag something as a primary key, it's automatically getting indexed. When something's a foreign key, it's able to piggyback off of that index to find data faster. But then you can create your own indexes that better answer your queries. There's a whole science around what's called covering queries, and it makes them run way, way faster if you know how to do it. That's why database administration is, is part science, part art, right? There's a little bit of creativity that goes into arranging everything to create the most optimal queries possible, and that's all a part of table design. Now, Don, you had mentioned earlier in the show, we had skipped over that one field, uh, I think it was called data types. Uh, can you explain that a little bit more for us? Oh, sure. So depending on the type of data we're putting in there, it needs to be able to store it, and it needs to store it efficiently, right? The main problem with storing data uh, when you don't know what the data is going to be is that it has to get written to disk. And let's say that um, I store um, Susan Smith, right? So I have an employee named Susan Smith. Her last name is Smith. It's only five letters, right? Um, and so I store it on the disk, and, um, and there it is, right, Smith? And it finds a place on the disk where there's room, and it writes it. And then it writes more data after her and, and continues writing data to the disk. Well, then one day, uh, Susan phones in, and she says, hey, actually, I'm getting married, and I want to change my, my last name so that it's now Smith-Johnson. Okay, all right, we, we can do that, right? And so I go in, and I change her record. Well, the problem is her last name was stored on the disk in a place that was only enough room for five letters, Smith. Smith-Johnson is a little bit longer, right? It's not going to fit. And so now the database has to move her somewhere else on the disk, which requires effort, which slows down the server. Now, we're talking very, very small, but imagine this happening millions of times. This would be a big deal, right? Also, imagine if she was already Smith-Johnson and she got divorced and says, oh, let's cut that Johnson part off. I'm just going to be Susan Smith now, right? So I go and I delete the dash Johnson, and now it's just Susan Smith. Okay, fine. Well, the dash Johnson part, that gets deleted, and now there's this little bit of room left on the disk. But we can't stick another record in there because it's right in the middle of her record where this last name is, and so now it sits unused, and it wastes space, right? So there's ways that disk space can be handled inefficiently if the server doesn't know what the type of data is going to be. And so when we go to set this up, we can give the server hints. And we can tell it, this is the kind of data I'm going to be putting in this field. And based on that, the server can make much better decisions about where to store the data, how to quickly access it, and how to protect the data when it is stored. All right. So when I create a table, so for example, when I created the contact table, the contact table is going to store a number of different things, like first name, last name, phone number, email. Each is a little bit different. Right? I didn't put in address. So let, let's add another field here for address one. Okay, well, this is gonna be a street address. And a street address is normally like a number followed by a, a street name, which is kind of a mixture of letters and numbers. Well, the default type is binary. Binary, well, it's expecting a number, and not, not really just any number. A binary number means either a zero or a one. That's not very flexible for me. But if it knows it's going to be 0 or 1, that's only one bit. It knows it's going to take one bit of space on the hard drive, and that's it, 0 and 1, easy. Right? Same thing with Boolean, which would be yes or no, true and false, Right? that, that it could, could measure that. But I want text. And so if I look down this list, I can find where there is text. This is going to be a text value. Right? Now, when I choose text, or more commonly character, which they don't show here because variable character is what's typically used, when I choose these, it's telling it I'm going to put in possibly a mixture of letters and numbers. Who knows? And it might just be one name, or it might be the entire text of Moby Dick, like just the whole novel. You, you can do that, right? Databases can store a lot of stuff. When you tell it text and you put a particular size, that's a hard limit. I'm going to say there's going to be 50 letters and numbers in here, right? And if I only put five in, it's going to take the space of 50 on the disk. But it's nice because it's already got the 50 laid out. And so if I have Smith stored in here with a size of 50, it's leaving 45 blanks afterwards. And if I come back and add Dash Johnson later, it doesn't have to move anything around because there was already 45 blanks. 
And if I removed Ash Johnson, it's okay because it just takes it out and I have those 45 blanks again, right? We know the size our database is going to be because we're putting a hard limit on what that size is. Disk space is cheap, so we don't normally care about wasting disk space anymore. So fixed lengths like these can really improve performance on your database. But if disk space is a concern, if I've got millions of rows, I could be wasting uh, gigs of data, uh, maybe even terabytes of data, who knows? So in that case, I could do what's called a variable character. And a variable character says, I'm going to put up to 50 letters, but I might put less. And if I do put less, you can store it as less. I'm okay with you moving it somewhere else later on if it changes. I'm okay with that. But if you can store it in less, do it because I'm more concerned about disk space. So a fixed length like text, we would use that or string for that matter. A fixed length like those, we would use if we were concerned about performance variable characters we would use if we were concerned about disk space, right? So it's performance versus disk space. Disk space is cheap, performance is expensive. So I normally worry about performance. I usually try and do fixed character lengths. So I can define that right here. This is going to be a string and maybe I'll set the maximum at 64 or 128 or whatever we want it to be, right? And, uh, and so then I can save that. But then if I add in something like zip code, right? Zip code, I mentioned earlier, it's going to be five numbers, right? Five numbers, I could come in and I could say that this is going to be a string that's going to be five. But the problem with saying a string is it could be letters as well, right? Letters or numbers. So that might be a problem for me. It might be okay. I, I think in Canada they use letters in their zip codes. Uh, I know they do in Europe. So so you, you maybe you want that. A five character string is perfect. That zip code, you pop it in there. But it could be that you want to enforce it as an integer. And with an integer, it's a little bit different because you're not saying five digits, you're saying five bytes. And a five byte number could actually be quite large. Um, if you do a, let's see, a 16 byte number would be able to go to, what is it, 65,535 running? Do you remember? I think so. So that's, that's five digits, but it cuts off at 65. So it's not even 65. big enough. We would need to go higher. We yeah. would need to do like a 32, no? 32 bits would be 4 billion, so. Okay, yeah, that'd be too big. So yeah. you have to do a little bit of, of sorting <laughs> here to figure out exactly where you want it to be. In this case, zip code probably would be better off just right. sticking with a string and enforcing a five limit. But then, then somebody comes along and does something crazy and says, we want to do the new zip plus four, <laughs> right? And so now you've got your five digit zip code and a four digit after it, and some people put a space, some people put a dash. Well, those aren't numbers. So I would need to do a string for those anyway, and I'd need to increase this to 10 to account for the five digit zip code, possibly a space and a dash, and then the four digit plus on it. So this is all stuff we have to think about when we store the data. And we're helping the server to know what that data is going to look like so that it can store it appropriately and, and manage that. And if I choose poorly, then it can really impact things. If I came in here and said, this is gonna be a five digit string, and then I get a call from the boss saying, hey, we wanna start supporting the new zip plus four. Well, shoot, I got a problem, <laughs> right? You can't just change data types. You'd have to back up the table, blow the table away, rebuild it with the right data types, and then, then reload. You can't change data type like that. It would actually be easier to say, you know what? I did a, I did a string five, my bad, right? So I'm just going to add another column. You, you can add other columns. That's easy. So I might do a zip plus four column. And I'll make that a string that's four digits, and I'll, I'll just store that four separate uh, and do it that way. And you can do that after the fact. So there are ways to get around it, but it kind of shows you how decisions we make today, we might regret down the road. I might have designed the database perfect for 2015. And then here we are in 2018, and something new happens, and that design is now broken. You can't, you can't see the future, right? You just have to try and design as flexible as you can. And, and that, that is a challenging part of database design. But, uh, but you have that flexibility. Those are called data types. And if you're designing a database, you have to worry about those. You have to pick the right ones. If you're using a database, they've already been picked. And you just have to worry about violating them, right? If, if I said uh, this is the state abbreviation and it's limited to two characters, and I try and put in three characters, I'm going to get an error, right? But that's all a part of, of database design and things that we have to worry about if we're going to be creating databases like these and implementing them out in the real world. All right, Don, there's a lot to think about there when we start taking a look at the idea of table design and working with databases. Remember that what we've taken a look at here, of course, is that idea of what creates a table or what makes up a table. Also, of course, the different table relationships as well as the data types that we 
uh, have to consider as we design these databases too. Don, final words for that database design for us. All right. Uh, hopefully, I wasn't uh, like overwhelming with this stuff. I tried to keep it fairly high level and cursory, but that also means that I didn't really get into any crazy detail. So again, if you like this stuff and you want to learn more about databases, definitely check out uh, things like Microsoft SQL Server, MySQL, uh, PostgreSQL. They're all database products. Some of them are free. Uh, PostgreSQL is completely free. You can download it, run it on your own computer. It gives you a great chance to learn databases, experiment, mess around with them. Websites like the one I was using, it was dbdesigner.net. It's free. You can go on there and you can mess around with doing a design. Uh, really cool ways to get your feet wet and start to learn the way of database administration. Databases are not going anywhere anytime soon. So it's a great career field to be in and a lot of neat opportunity there if if you enjoy working with data. And I, I know it's not for everybody. Well, thank you, Don. Once again, those were great examples that you showed us. And thank you also for watching as well. So signing off for IT Pro TV, I'm your host, Ronnie Wong. And I'm Don Pazette. Stay tuned right here for more of the CompTIA IT Fundamental Show coming your way. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.